to start the recording and call the meeting of the May 11th, 2021 CV Fiber uh, Governing Board to order. Um, the first order of business, as this is our uh, annual meeting, our meeting meetings start in May and they end in April. So this is the time where we uh, elect officers. And so David, as acting uh, vice chair, if I, I if I could ask you to take the helm from here to uh, preside over the election of the chair. Okay. So the first order of business would be: um, Do we have any nominations for the uh, chair? I nominate Jeremy Hansen. Second. Do we have any other nominations? Not hearing any other nominations. Um, I guess we'll take, yeah. Oh, did I hear one? Nope. Um, we do not have to vote when there's only one delegate, right? One nomination? Nope, you could just t direct the, the clerk to cast one vote for the body. Okay. So I'm I would like to request the clerk to cast one vote for the nominee, Jeremy Hansen, to be chair. So done. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for that. Um, the next office that we have to elect is for the vice chair. Um, I would like to nominate uh, Siobhan Pericone for the for the office, and I, I'm happy to, to talk more about that. But if there are any other any others that are interested in serving in the role of vice chair, Ray. I'd like to nominate Tom, Tom Fisher for office vice chair. Okay. I'll second it. Okay, so uh, technically, okay, so so R Robert's rules does not require seconding for nominations. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. Are there any other nominations? Okay. The, uh, what, one of the reasons that I um, th that I nominated Siobhan, and this actually goes for Tom as well, is that to fill out the executive committee and make an, an odd number of people, it would be important to have somebody who's a vice chair who is not uh, already an existing chair of a committee. So it makes things rather simpler. So um, I'm, I'm happy to you know, offer the candidates a moment to um, weigh in um, if they have anything to say about their, um, their candidacies, however brief this might be. Um, we can do this by voice vote. We can do this by, actually, we can't do it by voice vote. Um, <laughs> we can either do it by a, a roll call vote or we can do it by secret ballot. That is your um, that is your call. Ray, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I've worked with Tom on a number of committees and also subcommittees. And um, I think he could add a lot of value to the executive committee. So that's the reason for my nomination. Okay, fair enough. I nominated Siobhan because I know that she's been doing a lot of work in Orange and she has been part of the uh, project manager process and has done a lot of uh, a lot of behind the scenes stuff as well. So, and and having a woman on the executive committee, I think, is probably a good idea because we, we we don't have what what shall, how should we say a any sort of gender balance in this body. Getting there. Thanks, Lucy. We're, we're, we're getting there, slowly but surely. Katharina. Yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking of, of our, our newest members coming in. And we have a new member, um, a new delegate from Woodbury, and I don't see her here either. But uh, I'm just thinking of our, most of our newest additions have been, in fact, women. OK. Any other comments? How, how would you like to do this? Is anybody? have a preference I can take um, we can do roll calls or you can do secret ballot Jeremy I guess how do Siobhan and Tom feel about this do you, they both want it um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is mean, a reasonable question yes. I guess I'll go first since Tom's not unmuted um, I am willing to take this on. I did talk to Jeremy about this before. I'm willing to do this work. I have a little bit of nervousness about it, but I think that I would settle into it just fine. Um, I, I 
done stuff like this before. It's nothing new. Um, but at the same time, I'm doing other things, but I know Tom's doing other things. So, yeah, I'm, I am willing to do this and happy to do this, and I happen to agree, uh, uh, which will come as no surprise to any of you, that we do need more women on the executive committee. But um, that's, that's, that's where that is. I'll, I'll shut up now. I think that that speaks pretty well for me as well. Um, you know, I'm I'm happy to serve at the pleasure of the board, and um, I've been looking for ways to to get more involved. But um, I totally agree with the the need to have a solid representation across all different demographics. So I'm happy to hear however the board wants it to go. Okay, <clears throat> so. Thanks for that, both of you. That is, a, I think, a necessary first step before my question, which I will repose then. How would you like to do this? Would you like to do a roll call, or would you like to do it by secret ballot? I would really prefer a secret ballot. Fabulous. Okay, so what I, what I would ask you to do then is if you can, if you open up your chat in GoToMeeting, um, I will only vote if there is a tie-breaking vote. So everybody who is a is a delegate or serving as a delegate, which as I see right now would be uh, David Healy, Josh Jarvis, Jeremy Matt, Siobhan Perricone, John Morris, Alan Gilbert, Ray Pelletier, Phil uh, Ciccini, um, Katharina Mack, Henry Amistadi, Michael Birnbaum, actually Mike, Michael, you're a, a alternate now, um, Tom Fisher, uh, Ken Jones and RD Eno. These would be the people who can vote. So if you can go into the chat, change the send to from everyone, just choose my name, it's... send it to me, and then you can, and once I have everybody's votes, I will tally you... it up. Are you the organizer? No, I, uh... There you are, presenter. There you got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. See Jeremy, I'm I'm an alternate, and I I noticed that the uh, that the uh, Josh Jarvis is on the on the call, so he would uh, he would be the very town vote. Oh, that's that's true. Good good call, Phil. Okay, so I have a total of, let's see, eight plus four, I have a total of 12 votes. Oops, one more just came in. So I will close the ballot box in a moment if you haven't already cast your vote. And the vote goes to Siobhan. I'm happy to tell you the breakdown. I think it's probably ju just as well that I don't. But Siobhan earns a, a majority of the votes cast. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Siobhan. I appreciate your help. We will, um, Chuck, can we add her to the executive committee mailing list? Wonderful. Will do. Appreciate it. Okay, the next position to be elected is the clerk. Um, I will nominate our current clerk, uh, Jeremy Matt, for the position. Are there any other nominations for clerk? Hearing none, I will ask our clerk to cast one ballot for the body for himself. Seems kind of weird, but why not? And thanks and congratulations, Jeremy, for serving. We also have a uh, the position of the treasurer to fill. So our current treasurer is Jerry Diamatidis, and I am going to uh, nominate Jerry for the position of treasurer. Is there any other folks interested in nominating a treasurer? Okay, Here, hearing none, I will instruct the clerk to cast one vote for treasurer on behalf of the body for Jerry Diamantides. And we now have our officers elected. Thanks everybody, it's uh, easy peasy. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Michael. Um, I, 
point of personal privilege, I'd like to explain um, Plainfield's delegates situation at some point. Sure, that's a perfect thing to do in public comment. I'm just under the kind of unstructured stuff that's not on the agenda. I, I have one for that section too. Um, if you think it merits a longer discussion, I'm happy to add it as a formal agenda item. Um, I, I don't think so, but that's the pleasure of the body. Okay, so we, we, we'll see if it provokes any additional discussion and go from there. Okay, so um, public comment. Um, so I am, uh, I'll, I'll make my point here and then Michael, if we end up with a larger discussion, then we can go and, and do that. So um, I'm working with um, our recently departed um, delegate from Middlesex, uh, Phil Hayek, to draft some language for towns that are looking for some way of spending their ARPA funds. So I expect to have that sometime later this week. Um, and that's sort of like, it's, it's essentially establishing a groundwork for how they could, I don't wanna use the word partner because I think that's been beaten to death lately, but um, you yeah. know how they can work with us and how they can support our mission and how we can support construction and build out in, um, in, in the towns as well. Um, so I, sh I should have that together and something that's that's agreeable to to towns soonish um, and this is not not the sort of thing that we're, that I'm hoping to uh, put in front of a lawyer just yet it's essentially just figuring no. out where, where everybody is and then once we get to the point where we will you know essentially ask them for money we will have to sign a formal contract with with all of the towns to make sure nobody is surprised about who's doing what all right um, Anything else, uh, any public comment on anything that's not on the agenda before I hand it over to Michael to t do his public comment? Okay, Michael, it is your floor. Okay, thanks. Um, so Jeremy, Matt and I um, presented to the town of Plainfield um, our um, recommendation and reasons for switching positions. Um, we described to the select board that, um, that there is, to protect the integrity of the CUD, the district, um, we don't want appearances of conflicts of interest to exist. And um, I hope that you can all agree that um, in the past, um, I have not um, advocated on behalf of my private company or done anything um, untoward in, in regards to our conflict of interest policy. Um, and I considered completely resigning, but I, I asked to be appointed as an alternate. Um, so I asked to not be the delegate anymore because I wanted to um, protect the district from any um, outside accusations or, or internal that there was any kind of conflict of interest. And, but, um, but secondly, I'm still very devoted to the success of CV Fiber. I've worked for the last three years um, pretty passionately in favor of the CUD and I, really don't want to leave. I want to keep helping. I want to keep contributing. And, and so um, I thought this would be a way to do that. Um, it would be extremely rare that Jeremy wouldn't be here. Um, I would take his vote as the alternate on those rare occasions. And then I would still follow um, CP Fiber's policy on conflicts of interest. Um, so quickly, I wanted to just um, mention the high points of what that policy says. Um, it doesn't even mention appearances of conflict of interest. It's, it, it only deals with direct conflicts of interest, but despite that, I thought it was important. Um, essentially, um, a board member should not vote or act or, or get involved in discussions that could directly um, provide gain, whether it's personal or financial. Um, and it also should, and the all board
board member should protect the public trust of the organization. So if personal or financial gain can be derived by a board member, any of us, any of you who are direct delegates and alternates, it applies to alternates, um, then it is permissible if it is not gain that only um, accrues to, to, the, to the individual. If it, if it can accrue to others as well, then that's not considered a conflict of interest. And that's an interesting um, aspect of our policy. Um, but if you self-disclose that you believe there's a conflict of interest, you can still be part of the board. You don't have to leave the board, but you should disclose it, explain your reason, and recuse yourself from the discussions and votes um, on any matter where you would have a conflict. So in other words, it's not prohibited to be a member of the board and have a conflict of interest. It's prohibited to take advantage of your membership on the board with that, um, in relation to that conflict of interest. So I, I thought it'd be important for everyone to, to review that. Um, and I think that I could have remained as delicate and, 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 um, and observed all of those rules but I, I think Jeremy is very able. He's a wonderful member of the board and I have no problem with him representing our town. And as long as I am able to continue to contribute, I am confident that he will vote in the best interest of both the town and the board. And so I'm comfortable with stepping back from, from having voting and, and, and that kind of influence. And, and I will still, if I think that I'm going to be in conflict as an alternate, I will recuse myself. Thanks, Michael. That's c completely clear, and this is, this is something that's not a, not a surprise to me. But I, I I do appreciate your thoughtfulness and sort of adding that little extra buffer between your activities here and your activities elsewhere. I definitely do appreciate that. Does anyone have any questions for Michael about this, or Jeremy, for that matter, Alan? Can I just say that one thing Michael didn't mention that I think is important for everybody on the board is there are two ways that a conflict of interest can be identified. The, the one that's preferred is of course to have the member who he or she thinks may have a conflict of interest acknowledge that. Uh, and Michael talked a good deal about that. But the other way is for a member of the board who thinks that another member has a conflict uh, can actually ask that, that be discussed. And I think it's important to know that if somebody ever does feel that one of us has a conflict, we really should feel uh, uh, re responsible for bringing that up and having a discussion about it. So any sort of decision or any sort of outcome that, 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 that results uh, at least has been done in the open and people have been able to voice their opinions. So I, I thank Michael for being really pretty careful about telling us when he thought there might be a conflict or he wanted to note what his position was or what his relationship was in one, in one situation or another. I think it's worked out fine. I don't think anybody has been compromised. I don't think there's been a conflict of interest as identified in the policy. So I thank Michael for his service and I'm sure he's not gonna go away very quickly. I'm sure he's gonna be in about the same place on my screen. He has been for almost three years now. Actually, that's not true. My screen is only, what, one and a half years? <laughs> He's otherwise been sitting next to you somewhere. All right. Any other uh, questions or thoughts for Michael? Conflicts of interest in general? OK. Wonderful. So let's move on, um, unless anybody else has any public comment that they would like to add. Um, I'm going to move on to the consent agenda, and I'm going to move that we approve the consent agenda, which only includes the approval of the April 13th minutes as presented. Second. Okay, sh seconded by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Okay, are there any uh, objections, abstentions, or discussion desired? All right, I will take that motion as having passed unanimously then. Thank you for that. Uh, moving along to the treasurer's report, uh, 
Jerry Diamantides is traveling and Ray will be giving the treasurer's report in his stead. Ray, you have the floor. Sure. Do you have the uh, treasurer's report to put on the screen or you just want to? Um, we, can, we can put it on the screen. Let me make you a presenter, Ray, and you can take it from here. It is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, like, like Jeremy just said, Jerry is uh, traveling on business. This is the report through April for all the expenses um, for these first uh, four months of the year. And you can see what I'd like to call your attention to are the 12 items on the left hand side. Uh, those are all expenses that the board has approved over the course of uh, the last year or so. For example, we approved the contract for the Regional Planning Commission to provide admin services. We've approved legal, we've approved treasurer stipends, et cetera, et cetera. What you see here is that uh, January and February, um, no payments were made. And some of the payments that were then made in uh, March and April actually represented accumulations of payments or of work that was done in the preceding months. And so the March total, for example, was about $900. The April total was about $7,500 for a total of about $8,400. That's the expenditures year to date. The other thing that was in uh, Jerry's report is that he wanted you to be aware of the grants that we currently have and that we're currently drawing funds from for the work that we're doing. And so funding source A, uh, he, he describes as a limited use grant, uh, and this is CARES money. And then there's a funding source B, which is a, a general operating support grant, and there are various grants that we were provided that, we're, that we are um, using to pay, pay for the, um, our, our services, for example. And the, and the chart below that shows how that money has been expended. And uh, the next bottom, next to the bottom row, shows the grant funds that are remaining year to date. And it shows like 33.6 thousand for funding source A and almost 40,000 for funding source B. Where that's, where that's significant is here. This is that administrative um, uh, expenditures to date. And you can see that the third column is the column which shows the source of the funds. And so for exa example, the administrative services is funding source A. And uh, uh, legal is also funding source A, the treasurer stipend is funding source B. So here we have an example of the, um, uh, what our expenses are, where the money is coming from, and where we stand year to date. Uh, questions, comments? Yeah, go on. ahead, Ken. Yeah, I've had to suffer through a lot of organizations, and this is a really nice presentation. So thank you, Jerry. I think the minutes show that I can hear it. All right. Thanks, Ken. Any other questions or comments? Henry? Yeah, um, so I see 8,000 expended, but where's the all, all the other money that got spent that only left? 40,000 uh, of the initial grant funding. Is that under? Last yeah. fiscal year. Yeah. Oh, last fiscal year, okay. You can see that those columns here, grants total 160,000, for example, for funding source A. Oh, spent, spent in FY20, I see. Okay, good, anybody else? Not hearing anything. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen, I guess, if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, here we go. Probably there. All right. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Ray. Um, so let's move on. Clerk's report. Jeremy, do you have anything for us? Uh, I don't. I've been working a little bit more on the. I, I did upload all the rest of the minutes as we discussed last uh, meeting. Um, and I'm working on some of the meeting minutes for the committees, particularly the Planning and Development Committee, but I don't really have uh, a report. I have not yet received 
Um, I hope it's not in my inbox and I missed it, but I don't think I've received an invoice yet from CVRPC for last month's um, administrative services. Okay. So I'm sure that will be coming soon and we can, if we end up having a uh, another meeting in two weeks if we need to, or well, otherwise we'll see that in our, in our June meeting. Um, or maybe not, depending on the administrative budget and process, that's a little bit later. All right, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Let's move on to committee and Vicuda reappointments. Um, I think the Vicuda reappointments are simpler, so we can maybe start with those. We've um, we've delegated a, uh, a delegate and an alternate to Vicuda, which for those of you that are not familiar with it, that's the Vermont Communications Union Districts Association. It's all of the CUDs throughout the state meets it's, it's been meeting week, weekly almost and once every two weeks and then you know, periodically as things crop up. Um, as of now, I, um, I think I am the primary delegate and David is the, is the alternate. Um, we can leave that as is, so that seems to be going okay. If anybody else would like to serve in that capacity, um, we can do that. Otherwise, I would take, an, uh, I, don't really want to self-nominate, but if there's if anyone wants to change things or leave things the way, I would take a motion some way. Or I the other. nominate Jeremy Hansen to be the primary delegate to Vicuda and David Healy to be the alternate delegate to Vicuda. Second. All right. So I, I will I'm gonna kind of retroactively reframe that as a motion rather than as a nomination. Okay. If that's, a, if that's I, okay I wasn't with sure if it was a motion or a nomination, but yes. Because it's not technically an election, we can do it as an election if if you'd like. Otherwise, we're just it's just a motion to to appoint. So, um, any discussion? Okay, not seeing any any screams of pain. I will assume that everybody's good with this. So any um, uh, objections or abstentions or? Okay, I'm going to assume that the motion passes unanimously. Then, thanks for that. Okay, moving on to committee reappointments. Um, committee chairs, do you have, Andy, a, a list of who is on the committee? Um, this would be the time that we would, so we can sort of hand wave and say, reappoint all the people who are currently on the committee with the addition of whomever. I would just like to do this as a formal, as a formal additional step rather than sort of riding the wave of assuming everybody that's been appointed has, you know, remains appointed. Yeah, right. Uh, the only thing I'd say is that on cbfiber.net, on each of the committees, it lists all of who all the members are. And oh. might be the easiest way to go there and bring it up. And Wonderful. So let's start with, that's great, uh, communications committee. So I'm just going to read who's on the communications committee, and you can tell me if any of these need to change or if we need to add somebody. Um, so we have... Uh, R.D. Eno, Alan Gilbert, David Healy, Jeremy Matt, Ray Pelletier, and Tim Sullivan. One, two, three, four, five, six. Jeremy? Um, I'd like to step back from the communications committee. Sorry, Chuck. I just don't feel like I've been uh, contributing a whole lot to the actual working of the committee. And, you know, the meeting fatigue is, is getting to me. I, I think that I can be more helpful uh, in the planning and development committee. And, I would like to Chuck make a motion. Burke. Yeah, I would like to also make a motion um, to add John Morris and John Walters to the communications committee. Um, John okay. Morris, I don't, I don't know if you're interested or not, but you have made some contributions, so I figured I'd throw you in the in the lump. But you know, feel free to step back if you don't want it. Uh, but John Walters is here. He's a, a community volunteer. He actually wrote our last April update. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know uh, uh, about who he is, he's a journalist. He worked for many years for New Hampshire Public Radio, has also worked for both Digger and Seven Days in, in more recent times. Um, and it stays very on top of the ongoing to the state legislature, particularly as it, it pertains to uh, CUDs. So our very first conversation, I, I tend to open up with community volunteers of, do you know what a CUD is? And he is the first person who has ever said yes. So uh, uh, he, he has already proven to be an asset, and I would like to formally bring him forward onto the communications committee. It's what a cow eats. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. Alan? So I did second that. I don't... Yeah, okay. 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 Alan, for discussion? I think I've got to uh, uh, step back from the communications committee, too. I've, I've now gotten myself on three committees. <laughs> I'm chairing one. And I, I, it's, I, I just don't think it's fair to the communications committee that I'm probably going to skip some of the meetings. Um, so, Chuck, thanks, thanks for inviting me to join originally, and someday maybe I'll get back to it. All right. So, if I can maybe restate and again retroactively modify Chuck's um, motion. So, we're appointing uh, R.D. Eno, David Healy, Ray Pelletier. Tim Sullivan, John Morris, and John Walters to the Communications Committee, and, and Chuck Bird, of course. Does that seem? I put the same list in chat. I don't know if it was in a different order than Jeremy listed, um, so I don't know if I got it quite right. But this was who I, I was tracking. In case you want to reference it in chat. That's that's the same. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Any further discussion on this? All right. Any. Um, any no's, any abstentions, any other discussion? Okay, I'm gonna say that motion passed unanimously then. Thanks everybody. You have a newly formed communications committee, Chuck, or, or whoever you elect as the chair at your next meeting as the, the policy suggests. So let me back up and we will go on to, oops, I can find my finance and audit committee. Right now the finance and audit committee is made up of <clears throat> Ray Pelletier as the chair, Jerry Diamantides as the uh, treasurer, which as an ex officio non voting member, uh, Jeremy Hansen, Alan Gilbert, Jeremy Matt, Siobhan Pericone, Bill Cicini, and Tom Fisher. Are there any, any folks that should be that want to step back from that or that want to step forward to that? Siobhan? I would like to step back from that one. Okay. Okay, so removing Siobhan from the Finance and Audit Committee. Anybody else joining or leaving? All right. So if I can, here, maybe I will make a list like the one Chuck made too. Stand by. All right, so okay, I just put in chat Ray Pelletier, Jerry Diamantides, ex officio as treasurer, Jeremy Hansen, Alan, Alan Gilbert, Jeremy Matt, Phil Cicini, and Tom Fisher as members of the Finance Committee. I will move that roster. Second. Okay, seconded by Siobhan. Any other discussion, opposition, abstention, et cetera? Other words ending with ION? I'm going to take that as a unanimous approval. Thanks, everybody. We have a slightly modified finance and audit committee. Let's go on to planning and development. Right now, we have David Healy, Michael Birnbaum, Ken Jones, Jeremy Matt, Ray Pelletier, Siobhan Pericone, Jerry Diamantides, Jeremy Hansen, Greg Kelly, Tom Fisher. It's a rather larger board, um, but for pretty good reason. There's a lot of there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes that goes with that. Any takers or folks stepping back? Okay, this one's gonna be easy. Uh, Jeremy, just a question: um, Is Jerry as treasurer ex officio non-voting for any committee that he's on, or is it only for Finance and audit and executive committees. Only for finance and audit. I mean, and the executive committee. I, I I don't remember what we decided for that. I think he's. I think he's a voting member there too. Do you remember Ray? I see your hand up. Yeah, since he's not a delegate, he can't vote. Oh right, right, right. But he can right. vote if he is nominated to be a member of a committee. He can still vote on that committee. On a committee, yes. Just not on the executive okay. committee. This is the statutory requirements. Okay, so we have an unchanged um, planning and development committee. So I will say um, 
Again, well, I'll make a motion that we appoint uh, David Healy, Michael Birnbaum, Ken Jones, Jeremy Matt, Ray Pelletier, Siobhan Pericone, Jerry Diamantides, Jeremy Hansen, Greg Kelly, and Tom Fisher to the Planning and Development Committee. Second. Uh, Jeremy, Matt, beat you on that one, Siobhan. A rare, a rare race to the finish on that one. All right, so moved by me, seconded by Jeremy. Uh, any uh, objections? Okay, I'm going to take that as the motion passing unanimously. Thank you again. And last but not least, but smallest, we have the policy committee, which is currently made up of Chair Alan Gilbert, Siobhan Pericone, Ray Pelletier, and John Morris. Um, we have four members. Jeremy, mm -hmm. there, at our last meeting, Phil, Phil of Barry, um, attended and I thought he was on the list of members, but Phil wasn't sure himself whether he was. So it would be helpful to clarify whether Phil A wants to be an official member and B will be uh, will be a member because if he doesn't, we're down to four and it would be good to have an uneven number. Um, uh, sure, I, I'm actually quite clear that I was not before, but I was in the minutes as a member, therefore I guess I have no problem joining the committee. Thank you. It worked just by mentioning you. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. you. I appreciate that, Phil. That's easy. So unless I'm hearing any other folks stepping back or stepping forward, I'm going to move that we appoint uh, Alan Gilbert, Siobhan Pericone, Ray Pelletier, John Morris, and Phil Cicchini to the policy committee. Second. Okay, Siobhan got it that time, as usual. <laughs> A reliable seconder. And uh, any objections? <laughs> objections, I'm going to take that as unanimous consent. Thanks, everybody. Uh, anything else that we need to talk about with committee and VCUDA reappointments? Are there other committees that we need to be standing up? I'm going to go with hopefully not at this point. Okay, good. Moving on. Committee chair policy addendum. Um, would you take this one, Alan? Yeah, so if you remember, uh, you asked the policy committee to deal with the issue of how chairs of committees are appointed. And we met and came up with a proposal that was sent out, and you should have that for this meeting. There's an explanation of before the actual language that summarizes what we what we tried to do. Uh, briefly, the first thing is that it, it made sense to not have a policy on this, but to include it as a section of the CV fiber rules of procedure. I mean, that's really, that's really where it belongs. Um, and so what, we, what we're proposing to do is to simply add an addition to the rules of procedure. This would be a new uh, section <coughs> today called governing board committees. What we did was generally, we came up with a scheme whereby the committee approves <laughs> the, I'm sorry, selects a member of the committee to be chair, and then that name is forwarded to the governing board, and then the governing board uh, assents, uh, or I guess dissents, from the selection of that person. The reason we did it this way was that when somebody is chosen chair, they're not just being appointed the chair of the committee that's choosing that person, the person is also uh, automatically becoming a member of the executive committee. And the executive committee is, you know, arguably uh, probably going to be the most, uh, most, most, most worked and, and uh, most important committee, especially as we get moving on more and more actions involving a lot of money and, and a lot of public, uh, public uh, uh, notice and so forth and so on. So our thinking was that if you're going to be not only essentially electing a committee of your chair or nominating a committee of, of your chair, the whole board should really in the end have some sort of say about the membership of the executive committee generally. And this would be a way that the whole board would have a chance at some point to know who is on the executive committee 
and uh, would be given the chance to uh, to agree to that person's nomination, essentially by the person also having been appointed chair of a specific committee. So that was our that was our thinking behind that, and what we did was we came up with a structure of uh, how this would how this would happen. One thing I wanted to note was the first two subsections that we have in our J, one of them is sort of a general um, statement about how committees, what, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's, the, what's the way that committees have been authorized to exist for CUDs, and it references the state statutes. And then the second item is uh, a description of uh, if, the, if the governing board establishes an executive committee, who should be the members and who should be the chair. So what we've done is we have just simply said what's kind of evolved already uh, of who is a member of the executive committee. And we note on this that the treasurer um, of a CUD who, who, is, who is on the executive committee uh, can't be listed, is it, it, supposed to be a board member. Um, and the treasurer is prohibited by statute from being a board member. So that's why the board, the person who's the treasurer doesn't have voting rights on the executive committee, but they can, they can, they can participate as a member who's not a board member. I, I'm sorry, they can participate as a treasurer who's not a member of the board, but just a member of uh, the public essentially, but uh, an appointee of, of, uh, of us. The rest of the section three, four, five, and six subsections uh, lays out the scheme by which the committee chairs first are selected by the committee. The committee then forwards the name to the governing board, that's, that's us, and the governing board has a chance to approve the essentially selection or nomination of the committee chair by the committee. And then there are there, there's a whole. There are there are details about how this happened, when when it happens, what happens if the person actually uh, is not approved. Uh, what happens? It goes back to the committee, and the committee comes up with another nomination, and that goes back to the chair until eventually somebody is found. That's the scheme. I hope you had a chance to look at it. We thought it was pretty solid, but of course, we, we had a couple suggestions from uh, that that came up between the time I sent this out to the whole board. Uh, two of them, two of them make intuitive and uh, sense, and we we really should make these changes. Uh, one of them is uh, in section five. In the third sentence of section five, uh, the word "may" is in there, and it really should be "shall." It's a, it's a must instead of a discretionary action that is to be taken. And the other, and, and I'm, I'm recommending uh, for the committee that, that we do make that change. And the other place that we think there should be a change in what we originally wrote is we'd like to see inserted uh, in the second sentence in section six, after the opening of the sentence that says at that time, we would like to see inserted the language in the event of resignation or incapacitation. So the, the person who came up with this suggestion uh, caught, th was thinking of something that we weren't thinking of, wh which is what happens if the person uh, leaves the board or it becomes ill or can't serve or whatever. We really need some, some sort of way of, uh, uh, of having another committee person. So what adding in the event of resignation or incapacitation to that second sentence in section six after at that time it it it, it helps us deal with a situation that uh, could come up and we thought that was that made sense the other changes that were suggested were really style and syntax uh, suggestions they weren't substantive and i would ask if anybody who made those suggestions wanted to bring those up now after I'm finished with this with this uh, review and, uh, of what we've done, I, I in, invite you to speak up about that. Um, the only other thing, the only other suggestion that came up that I think 
if you want us to noodle about this some more, the committee would have to take this up at its next net, next meeting. Um, there was a suggestion to change the last section in sentence in section six, so that in the, in the case of no chair being chosen at a committee's annual reorganization meeting uh, in, in May or whenever the, it takes place, the governing board chair, uh, would, that would be Jeremy in this case, would appoint, a, would appoint a temporary one rather than what we have in the language before you. Um, that we said the current committee chair should stay in the position until a new one is chosen. The reason why we chose that language, the committee chair stay in the position in the two, until a new one is chosen, is actually the language that's applied to delegates, if you remember this. If we're not reappointed each year by our select boards, we stay in that position until a new delegate is appointed or until we're reappointed. And we thought doing the same thing for the chairs made intuitive sense just to keep the wheels rolling and you know the grease going in there. But I guess you can imagine some situations where you have a chair who never gets reappointed for, I don't know, whatever reason, and it becomes a little bit difficult to even think about that person not being chair when there might be a time the person has to be removed uh, or some other circumstance comes up. So I'm going to let the person who suggested that language, if he would like to uh, like to say something about that, why they think it's important to include that. Otherwise, I think we could do without it and assume that a committee would go ahead and uh, appoint somebody uh, who would then would, whose name then would be forwarded to the board, to the governing board. So that's what we had. All right, any, any discussion about this? All right, to move this along, I will move that we adopt, um, that we amend our rules of procedure to include section J as presented by the policy committee with the, um, with the amendments that Alan mentioned, changing the, the may to the, the shall and adding the, um, in the event of uh, something or incapacitation. or incapacitation. Resignation or incapacitation. I just wanna make sure that that's out there and clear. Um, and Alan, if you could, w once you have those edits, if you could uh, send that to the entire to the entire board, that would be, that so that we know it will be just approved, that'd be terrific. Second. What I'm, right. what I'm going to send you then is, is just those two sections. That's fine. Because pe people, should, people should have the whole policy. I, I don't wanna burden you with all the other stuff. Sure, Ray. I put it in the chat room. Uh, w with, uh, with the modifications? Yes. Oh, wonderful. So it's in you. the chat. Great, Ray, thanks. I, was, I wasn't sure if that one had incorporated the changes or, or not. Jeremy? So I just noticed that a uh, caller one showed up on the call and uh, caller one, if you'd like to identify yourself uh, to be included in the minutes, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, that's a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> Do you make the motion and uh, was there a second? It was moved and seconded. Just we're at discussion now. Okay. Okay. Any any further discussion? Okay. Yeah. Chuck? Um, I have one point that is actually not about this, but it's related to the statute that was included at the tail end of that document. Um, should I just bring it up now or after we go through the vote? It's not going to impact the vote, I don't think. All right, well, let's see. Yeah, let's let's do the vote then, and we'll we'll circle back around to that in just a second. Any other discussion on this? Okay. Any objections then? Okay. Then I'm going to assume that we have unanimous approval. Thanks for that. Our rules of procedure are now amended. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, there, there was a call out to the statute at the end of the document that was circulated around the full text of Title 30, Chapter 82, Section 3071, talking about how if there was an executive committee established, members of the executive committee would serve staggered terms. I was wondering if we were going to do something about that. I think that means you walk away from the meetings uh, rolling from left to right. 
Mm. <laughs> That's the best I could come up with. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe ev every... Jeremy, Jeremy has has anybody in Vicuda brought this up or noticed this or it's it's odd. It, it's it's odd. I, I don't know how you would stagger a term across delegate delegate terms that are only a year in the first place. So I mean we could we could appoint executive committee members you know, for two every years. Every three months. No, every yeah. three months we need to change them. I mean, so like, yeah, you you set what set one one clock one minute ahead of the other, so it's it you know it never actually gets to closing time. You just say no, it's that clock, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, when I was drafting the executive committee charter, I obviously came across this, and um, uh, my feeling was that uh, there's sufficient turnover amongst us as delegates that uh, over the course of you know the next three or four or five years. That there's going to be staggered terms even on the executive committee so uh, it's going to happen organically uh, and if not then the board has selected the right people to uh, appoint the executive committee the people that they trust and have confidence in so um i i think we can um reasonably say that we serve staggered terms because by virtue of me being chair and the vice chair being the vice chair we are already currently on the executive committees the other members of the executive committees as the committee heads that we have decided to you know to pass that responsibility on to the committees those people won't be appointed to the executive committee until next month so we have staggered terms there we go Alan, you had something else on this? I just wanted to say thank you to Ray and John and Siobhan and Phil for helping out on this policy. This was this was an interesting one. I, I, I didn't see the way straight through this at first, and we had a good discussion about it, and, and uh, I just really appreciate people's help. I appreciate you, you uh, wrangling everybody and putting this all together. So that was you know, clearly something that we needed some uh, clarity on. Okay. Anything else that folks want to talk about with the uh, committee's chair policy, et cetera? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Approval of materials from the Planning and Development Committee. Um, I'm happy to have you, David, I'm happy to have you take um, all of these. You can just have the floor until you're done with all of them. No, <clears throat> Ray's gonna do the first one. Ray, do okay. you wanna share the screen with that? All right. Um, yeah, you should still have presenter it. rights. So I, I have uh, put the, motion and material in the uh, in the chat room and I'd, I'd just like to speak to it actually so the, the motivation for a joint cub agreement among cv fiber ec fiber and northeast kingdom broadband nek broadband is that we're all working together uh, with WEC on uh, uh, on the rus financing right to build out the, the network uh the WEC network which is going to inure to our, our particular benefit and we felt like it was important that we could um, speak together as one, with one voice so that we would work together and come up with com a common position on certain things. And um, some of the outcomes, for example, are going to be before us tonight for, for adoption. For example, uh, we have worked together to develop an, uh, a high-level design statement of work, a high-level design RFP. And you're going to have an opportunity to vote on on the, uh, the, the RFP tonight. Um, we have also um, uh, worked together to to put in an application for a high level design, a joint high level design uh, grant application. Um, and we're also we've also decided amongst us, for example, that we will share the cost of different things, which could include the high level design if we don't get a grant, for example. But it also includes, let's say, legal costs, and the sharing of those costs, for example, is broken down by the amount of WEC miles that are being developed in each of our CUDs. And the, as a rough number, um, uh, CB Fiber has the majority, and more than the majority of the miles that are being developed. They come to about sixty percent, plus or minus, and the other two have about twenty percent, plus or minus. And so we have an agreement with regard to that. So the, the motion is uh, that 
the um, board approved CV Fiber entering into an agreement of cooperation, collaboration, and cost sharing and authorize the executive committee to approve the details of that agreement. Second. Okay, moved by Ray, seconded by Jeremy. Any um, thoughts or discussions on this? This is um, kind of the kind of the first necessary step for us to sort to move forward and do this big kind of arm in arm linkage with the other CDs and with WAC so that we can move forward and really, I mean, there's a there's a wonderful sort of economy of scale that's going on and we'll move everybody's plans forward. Um, much more quickly, so I, I definitely support this. Any other any other feedback on this initial motion? Okay. I, I'm in favor of cooperation. So it seems to be going fairly well so far. All right. Well, if there's um, do, are there any objections, abstentions, etc. All right, I will take that as a um, unanimous approval. Thanks for that. Ray, you have another one then? I do, and uh, this actually gets to the high-level design RFP that I just mentioned. And um, uh, the motion is uh, the board approves, move that the board approve the issuance of a high-level design RFP on behalf of WEC, NEK Broadband, and EC Fiber and authorize the executive committee to implement this action. And what I would tell you is that um, um, an RFP has been developed and the plan is that it, it be issued on Friday and that we start getting responses back in June uh, for uh, possible starting by the end of June and the beginning of July for this high level design for an 800 mile network across these three CUDs. So um, uh, the group has been working, uh, the group is ready, and we're ready to issue this RFP. So I hope you'll approve the motion. Second. Second. Okay. So I heard a second before Jeremy second. Was that you, Chuck? Oh, that was Tom. Oh, it was Tom. Tom. So moved by Ray, seconded by Tom. Michael, you have something? You're muted. Um, Ray, for the benefit of the whole board, uh, I think it'd be useful to define what a high-level design is. Yeah. Or if you need assistance, I'll be glad to, but go ahead. Well, I'm going to punt this to David. I didn't do the statement of work. I don't do statements <laughs> of work. <laughs> so the, uh, the statement of work that was prepared for this RFP was done collaboratively with Carol Monroe from ValleyNet and... Um, Bill Powell from WEC and NEK Broadband, I guess it was Christine Hallquist. So that's where the, and, and Chris, um, Carol Monroe drafted the basic statement of work. So it's a high level design. Basically it covers how everything is connected to everybody and everything, both in terms of the kinds of equipment, the, um, the links between things, um, hub locations are supposed to be identified, um, all the connectivity that needs to be made and for the whole district so that there's a unified design for all of the WEC territory. And Michael, if I missed something in there, please add to it. Um, that was good. I, I, what, what a high level design is not, maybe is an easier way to put it. Um, it isn't all of the color coding of all the fibers and how they connect to each other and the assignment of different fibers to different residences and businesses, but it is, and, and it isn't necessarily in as great detail as is necessary to construct, but it's, it's the design that's useful for budgeting and applying for grants and that sort of thing. So it, it shows where everything will go and be pretty close to real mileage, but not accurate. And uh, it doesn't identify poles, it doesn't identify drops, but it, it, it's uh, like halfway there. Um, the other half is actually um, triple the amount of work, 
but it's still halfway there. I don't know if that was confusing or not. Ken? So is it the sort of product that is done relatively quickly, or is it one that we need to also establish priority so that we can initiate builds on uh, the, our chosen routes? It's quick. Wonderful. Any other questions or thoughts about, yeah, Henry? And then Phil? So this is um, basically um, the design for the middle mile so that all the CUDs could figure out how they're working off of the, the main lines and um, may not in, include all of the all the lines that are going to be put in or you know the design for putting lines in everywhere but not um, uh, having enough bandwidth to put lines into everybody but not necessarily designing the wiring to everybody but having adequate bandwidth to eventually supply everyone if that contingent you know as a plan yeah go, go ahead michael um, can, the, the, your second version was closer, Henry. Um, it has nothing to do with bandwidth, though. Um, and so it's all, the, it's all the middle mile, but it's all the distribution miles as well. So it's all the fiber that goes by every location. Um, but what it, do, what it doesn't include is identifying which fibers are going where and all of, all of the passive optical network design that's necessary. So uh, I, I think what might be clearer then in the language it says for the purposes of completing a middle mile fiber project, could we make that for completing a fiber to the premises project? Does that make more sense? Because this is not just a middle mile project. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I have, let's see, I have a lot of hands up. I had uh, Phil, then Jeremy, then Ray. So Mike, my, my, I had a question just on budget. Uh, what's this cost and is, do we have the funds now or is this contingent upon getting additional funding? So the next motion is about the budget. <laughs> okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, Jeremy? So I just wanted to say that I saw a caller two show up on mute. So uh, caller two, if you just uh, recently connected and you would like to identify yourself for the minutes, uh, please feel free to do so. I heard caller two unmute, but I didn't hear anything. Well, caller two is gone. Well, if you if we okay. spot him again, Jeremy, we'll we'll try that again. Go ahead, Ray. Okay. Um, just to state that uh, this is not a detailed design. That we still have to do a detailed design after this higher level design is done, and that detailed design won't get done until the full data has been collected. And so this is a high level design and the, the motion itself is the, therefore the move, the move the board approves the issuance, all the whereas stuff is just, you know, preamble, right? So um, uh, that's what we're looking for a vote on. I would, I mean, if, but, but if we're going to be precise, if we're going to use la language that means what we mean, I think if we can if we can just agree to change middle mile fiber to fiber to the premises, I think that that sounds more precise to me. Yeah. I mean, if you're just willing to take that as a friendly am amendment, Ray and Tom, then we can just modify that. If it'll get your votes, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, you could call it distribution too instead of middle mile. Okay, well, we can do a lot of things, but if you have a, so if it, <laughs> if it needs to be middle mile and distribution, that, that that's fine. Or we, I mean, it's overall about a fiber to the premises project. We're not building Velco middle mile style, right? Yeah. That's not what sure. we're building. That's, we agreed, didn't we? Yeah, I thought we agreed. Okay, so we're good there. Any, any objections to that as, as amended, as kind of retroactively? removed, et cetera. Okay, I don't hear any objections, so I'm gonna take that as uh, as unanimous approval. You got your motion, Ray? 
Uh, looks like David, you're up on the next one. Okay, let me post it in the uh, chat box. So now that we've approved an RFP, we have to get money to do this. And so the three, the, the four entities are the three entities. Um, this motion is to um, seek Department of Public Service pre-construction grant money in what was considered the round one that was, they're still working on their terminology of how they're gonna ask for applications that hopefully are coming out tomorrow. But um, the legislature has authorized pre-construction money and so the group of us are applying for $200,000 to do the high level design in the wet, wet territory. So this is a motion to approve CD5 to participate in that grant application in terms of signing it with the three other entities. Second. Second. Okay, moved by David, seconded by Siobhan. Any other discussion? So, so again, this is going after money that's not that's been approved, but the process has not technically been finalized yet. But it will, we're ready to pull the trigger soon. So, I see uh, Chuck and then Phil. For the benefit of anybody who might be dialed in and, and not uh, viewing the chat, I would like to ask that the motion in its entirety be read, please. Okay. Just the, the, the more motion portion, I, the preambles. I, I okay, therefore the board approves a submission of a joint pre-construction grant application for $200,000 to complete a high level fiber network design for the WEC territory to the De Vermont Public Service Department and authorizes the executive committee to implement this action. Thanks Chuck, and thanks David. Okay, Phil. Uh, yeah, just a, a clarification. The two hundred thousand dollars is is um, we would apply on behalf of the consortium, or would it be um, two hundred thousand is our portion of that, and they'd all, they'd have they'd funds that they'd be going after? How what is the uh, the the total budget for this? The total budget is two hundred thousand, okay. and. We are applying jointly, so we don't know exactly what the impact will be on our future grant requests individually, but as a joint um, showing collaborative and a partnership endeavor, we thought it was best that we apply for the money jointly. So hence, and it's for a design that we're all using, so. So roughly, I mean, the way that we had been allocating this before, if you imagine whatever 60% of, 200,000 is, you know, that would be our you know, roughly budgeted amount that, that we would be getting, even though that's, it's may not ever even hit our, our bank account. So we, ha I don't know exactly how we're going to do that. I, I, I think we are currently, cause you know, uh, you know, David and Ray have been spearheading this. I think, you know, we are the lead um, applicant, if I'm not mistaken. So it, so the whole, the whole amount may hit our bank account. We may be the ones responsible for, uh, dispersing the funds on behalf of the of the group. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay, hearing none. Any objections to this? Abstentions? All right, I'm going to take that as unanimous approval. Thank you for that. So our number three has passed. David, you can take number four. When and did somebody say something? All right. So the next item is to uh, approve a high level design RFP for the remaining part of the CV fiber network to be done concurrently with the high level design for the Washington Electric territory part of it. And included in this RFP would be um, include the same engineer who does the work will be hiring them or proposing to hire the the same firm to do the detailed engineering on the phase one route so that we're not spinning our wheels one more time so this is um the statement of work is identical to the um the um, earlier statement of work with the addition of continuing to do the detailed engineering for the phase one route so, so, so moved 
Okay, that was seconded by moved by David, seconded by Jeremy. Could you um, would you actually read the uh, the mm -hmm. the meat of this again, David? Yep. Therefore, the board approves the issuance of an RFP for the high level design for the remainder of the CV fiber district and detailed engineering for phase one and authorizes the executive committee to implement this action. Okay. Henry, then Ken. Yeah, uh, um, so the high level design for WEC and then there's a high level design for say GMP and everyone else. And then there's the phase one detailed design. Why are those coupled with the part two of the of the other one um would you uh, um, so I mean, there's two high level designs and then there's one detailed design of correct one. and so it's and a question this the motion has a high level design and a detailed design in together as i'm trying to understand is that one proposal or two separate proposals that we're voting on together or one rfp that does both high level design for the remaining of the cv fiber district and and then would also include in the same rfp includes a statement of work for completing the detailed engineering on phase one project that we've planned <clears throat> and is the is that because the phase one is is not in washington electric co-op they are not doing a detailed engineering study yet. So, oh, so, and, so this is this so is, they're only they're running. Uh, sorry, they are running the the middle mile fiber. We have to do the engineering to connect to all the houses. Yeah, uh, good point, Henry. Yeah. So, so, so. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the reason that we're doing this. This is still in the phase one of the grant buckets there's two phases of these grant buckets that are going there so we're going collectively in phase one and then we're going also in phase one to do a to get all of the rest of cv fiber to a high level design and then again with the timing because we want to go and get our our actual our phase one stuff done we're then going to then ask the same person that's doing all this work then to then focus and say go do the high level design for all of cv fiber and all of WEC and then narrowly look at fa our phase one and give us the detailed engineering for those 130 miles. And then if you hang on for the fifth part of this, you will see what's happening in phase two as we're sort of going after the next bucket of money to go and do our phase two and, and so on. You'll hear David talk more about this okay. in a second. So I think I understand then that the reason for breaking it that way is because the other one was with the group and these and these two are just for us, and yep. one is the other part of high level design, the other is details. Okay, I got yeah. it. Yeah, it's not simple. <laughs> okay, Ken, and then Michael. Yeah, so, so my question is: the, uh, Do the other members of our team kind of agree that that as we select a firm that is is the one we're really wanting for our detailed engineering, that they'll be comfortable that yeah that we we'll, we agree. That's also good for the high level design for the whole area. Has that discussion been had or, and maybe it is kind of a moot issue. Maybe it's just so automatic, the same firms are gonna do it, but has that discussion been had? No, but I think the review committee ought to include um, more people from CV Fiber on the, the CV Fiber review of the proposals, <clears throat> similar to the, what we've been doing for poll inventory and PM kind of thing where there's three to four members of the committee who are reviewing the proposals. But we haven't decided that as in terms of answering your question. Okay, Michael. So uh, let me uh, amplify the answer to Ken's question first. Um, wh when you work with a firm to do the high level design, it's very efficient for them to do the detailed design based on the work they've already done and typically they extend a discount to anyone who hires them to do the detailed design. So you get some refund or some credit from the high level design that was already done. So it's absolutely, unless you're really unhappy with the firm's early work, it makes sense to stick with the same firm. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention was 
that WEC is not doing a middle mile project. They're doing the whole thing, the whole distribution, but it's all dark fiber. It's not lit. We have to put the equipment in to light it, we have to do the drops, the service drops to the houses and businesses. But the middle mile or the, the main trunk lines are kind of the middle mile, but all the distribution poles are also going to be reached in the WEC project. Okay. Thanks for that, Michael. Was there anything else you wanted to add? You said you wanted to answer Ken's first. I just didn't know if there's anything no, else you no, wanted to add. The second part was. I just answered both, did both things. Okay. All right, fair enough. Anything else on this um, phase one combined high level detailed RFP? Okay, any objections to this motion? Okay, I'm gonna take that as uh, unanimous approval. Thanks for that. Now we're, get, now we're getting somewhere, slowly but surely. Fifth motion, David. Yeah, so the next motion is to deal with the grant application to do the high level design. And if I could, if you could share the screen with me, I wanna yeah. show the detailed breakout of the, 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 the money we're asking for from the state of Vermont. Okay, you do have you, it. Do you really? Okay. <laughs> Can everybody see that? Yes. So the way they're doing the grant applications initially anyway, was there's gonna be a round one and a round two. Uh, according to the information I got today from the state, there's probably only gonna be one round. And it's sort of complicated because of the way the legislation's working, but in any event, the round one grant application was supposedly the work that had to be budgeted and spent in the next three months, two months. So, and, and they also request that we put priorities on this. So poll data collection, phase one, the amount of 225,000 is in here. And that is, we have bids that have come in. We're gonna review them tomorrow from the three companies we selected to get bids from. The second is for high level design, network design for the remainder of the district. And I think, um, yeah, I, this is where, uh, when we finally get around to doing this, there may have to be some modification of this project manager support. And we're reviewing project manager ref, uh, people tomorrow, I believe. I, I've forgotten which day we're reviewing those. And then general administrative legal support for an amount of 425,000. Round two grant application was poll data collection phase two, which is basically the, the good chunk of the rest of the district and the detailed engineering phase one. I think when we put this together, we need to put the detailed engineering up in the first group of priorities. Um, in any event, this is the kind of money we're asking for. And um, it's unclear whether they have all this money right this this month, but based on what the legislature has passed or has passed previously, the uh, the money should be there. In fact, I think if I go to the next slide. Oops. Oh, but David, just one thing, um, you have those priority numbers there and I think they're backwards. Because you say five is highest. Oh yeah, no, I screwed it up, thank you. I just changed it to one is highest. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, but any, just to give you an idea of how complicated this gets, um, this is the kind of money that if I understand the money that's coming out from the department in the next two, three months, there's the money that we've been waiting for since last year that got tied up with the Northern Border Regional Commission grant to leverage the VITA loan. There's two and a half million dollars coming out in June. And that was, you know, the leveraging was never clear whether it was including, you know, construction engineering or just the construction. So that one's up in the air a little bit. H315, which has already passed, has 1.6 million. And that's what this current grant is asking for. And then H360, which just passed, it's got these weird amount of monies of 20 million, 80 million, and 50 million. Um, 
that there'll be, you know, the you know, timing of which is, you know, these are my best guesses. So my feeling is the reason I'm putting this there is just to show that I'm pretty sure we're going to have money to do what we're talking about. Um, but that's that's sort of where we're at. And so going back to this one, I think there needs to be some more work out before giving this to the executive committee um, and before we get actual guidance, rev revised guidance from the Department of Public Service. But our highest priorities are the poll data collection one, a uh, high level design network for uh, the balance of the non WEC area and the detail engineering for phase one and poll data collection phase two. Um, the project manager support and general admin and legal assistance. We still have money left in our budget from the previous grants we have for a general admin and legal support. So I'm not sure we need to make those a high priority, but. Um, they're going to decide how much money they want to give to us. Um, so we have to be pretty explicit about our priorities and our needs. And so that's why I've sort of broken it out this way. So, yeah. uh, so David, if you could again read the um, read read the kind of the body of of the motion there. And yeah. uh, I noticed in in your breakdown there, you had a slightly different number for round one than you have in the motion. The, the motion says four hundred and twenty, and your breakdown at four hundred and twenty five. Yeah. So, we got to get to the chat again. Here we go. Um, so that'd be it. therefore the board approves the submission of a CV Viber pre-construction grant round one application of 425,000 and a round two application of 490,000 to the Vermont, Vermont Department of Public Service and authorizes the executive committee to implement this action. Second. Okay, moved by David, seconded by Ray. Jeremy. Um, so that 425,000 does not include the high level or the detailed design rather because that was in round two, two. but you had mentioned moving that to round one of which yeah, honestly yeah, look, i think would be a good idea yeah but, it looks like it's only going to be a round one okay so would we include all of the items in both round one and round two in, in our one application okay i understand so then, in moving the high level design up of the second pole level, I mean the detailed engineering. So then, it, so it seems to me that we shouldn't have a in the motion. It shouldn't be you know, that we're going to do a grant of round one for four hundred twenty-five thousand and round two of four hundred ninety thousand. So it's only going to be one round. When I modify it to what's that? Nine hundred and ten, nine hundred and fifteen thousand. Yeah. Oops. I can't. Ray, did it. you want to add something while David's doing that? Yeah, I, I didn't even make it more general, but um, in the sense that really what we need the board to approve is the, that the CV fiber submits a pre-construction grant application for full data collection. Um, high level design and detailed design engineering, and a, a couple of other things which now escapes me at the moment. Um, and let the, let the executive committee sort it out because more details continue to unroll, unfold, and uh, we're frankly not going to submit the application probably for another two weeks because we're not going to have the guidance from uh, the state perhaps in the next couple of weeks. So I don't think we have to get too detailed about it. Yeah, I think that the critical thing is a little bit of flexibility. And I also know the sooner you get your grant application in, the sooner you're going to get the money and hopefully, I hate to say this, but beat out the CUDs to the punch. Okay, anything else on, on this? All right, any objections to the motion as uh, lightly amended? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Um, anything else on PDC stuff, David or Ray? No, uh, no. Ray, do you have anything else? <laughs> it's been a busy couple weeks. 
<laughs> so I, I would actually like to um, like to kind of insert a, an agenda item here that's sort of related to to all of this. You know, D David, you had your um, your screen up, and you had you know funding from municipalities and what and whatnot. Um, and we had talked. I talked earlier about um, working with the towns and coming to an agreement. And it, uh, it occurred to me as I got a message from from Phil um, that we may want to move more quickly to actually draft the um, the actual contract language. So I would like um, if we can if we could get some approval. Uh, I want to think about how how to move this. Um, if, if folks want to help me with this, uh, how to move approval for the legal costs of having. Um, in those contracts with towns reviewed because if we have towns that are ready to ready to move and we can sort of slot them into one of these one of these projects um, these sort of cash buckets it would be great to do so right yeah so uh, you might want to postpone that we're, we're about to consider an administrative budget which is a line item for legal oh that's right that's right. Wonderful. You're you are absolutely 100% correct. So why don't I hand that off to you, uh, administrative budget and process? That is yours, Ray. Great call. Okay. Can the, can you let me share my screen again, please? Uh, did it take it away from you? It did. Okay. Only because you gave it to David. Yeah. Fight nice, kids. <laughs> So um, on this screen here is an administrative budget, a proposed administrative budget that the Finance Committee, together with the Treasurer, uh, worked on. And the Finance Committee is, is uh, recommending that um, uh, the board approve this administrative budget. Let me see what I have here, if anything. Um, so let me let me go through this uh, a little bit. One Can is you again, maximize the screen. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, so what are you seeing? Okay. That help? That's perfect. Okay. So again, the, the first 12 rows there are items that uh, the board has approved in the past. Um, let me call out a couple of things um, about this. And that is that uh, you're look, looking at item like number 10. It says uh, single audit. And you know, as a as a result of law, we have to we have to do a um, an audit. Um, but the line item is in the budget because um, uh, we're not going to we're not going to expend any money this year for the audit. The audit's going to take place in January, February of next year. Um, these projections that you see here through the end of the year are based on uh, commitments. One based on commitments, for example the bookkeeper, the clerk, and the treasurer, for example. Uh, they're also based in law, like the audit. Um, number three, they're based on contract expectations. So for example, at number one, admin services. We have a contract with the Regional Planning Commission in which we said that uh, it might cost us $15,000 or something this year. And so we kind of extrapolated over a period of N months uh, how much that might cost, for example. And then we have um, uh, expected workload. And for that, I would point to number seven, legal. And here we see that we might expend over the course of the year, uh, over $21,000. And this is the, the burn rate in which we might expect to spend uh, the, legal, uh, the legal funds. And of course, we're doing, we're, frankly, we're doing a lot of legal work. And if you'd have seen, the recommendation from a, a third party to the Senate Finance, the Senate Finance Committee, uh, they recommended that um, that CUBs uh, have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in their budget for legal, uh, because of all the legal work that has to get done. And and I'm not kidding you that um, uh, we're not going to spend that much this year, I don't think. But um, uh, there's definitely a need for legal. So here are all the different things that we previously kind of approved. Okay. Um, and so the promotion is uh, in the finance committee, uh, where is that? Uh, the finance committee recommends that the board approve an administrative budget for administration by the executive committee. Is there a second? second? David, second. Okay. Moved by Ray, seconded by David. 
any uh, any further discussion? So I, ha I have Chuck and then Henry. Thank you. Um, Ray, I would ju just suggest, and I sent an email about this to Jerry, but let's consolidate uh, rows four and 12. Four is really a dependency, four, 12, and it's a nominal if at all expense. So let's just consider it all one line, line item. I have no objections to that. Right. That seems reasonable. Uh, Henry? Chuck, um, my question was about website 3000 in December and wondering if, if we might need some website work sooner than December and what your thought was around um, end of year web development or whatever. Mind if I take the floor, Jeremy? Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, great, great question, Henry. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so we actually have our website developer retained, and she has indicated that she is uh, feeling that she is prepaid through the end of this year for anything we might ask her to do that is not kind of a major structural overhaul. You know, if we kind of continue going to her with little tweaks here and there, um, she she is very happy to contribute to the cause and feels that the retainer we paid her at the end of last year more than covers uh, that ongoing work. Um, so, you know, this would be more bucketed as how do we start to fund work subsequent to this fiscal year? Um, and, you know, maybe that begs the question of whether we should align said costs in this fiscal year in which they are likely to fall. Um, but frankly, there's a lot of unknowns here. You know, I don't know when that goodwill with our particular uh, developer will run out because she is not inclined to track her hours closely and and ensure that we are hitting an exact budget. So um, there may come a point where she said, I feel I've done enough and we do have to start to put some funds together to accomplish something we wanna accomplish. Um, but in the meantime, I'm, I for one am of the opinion that we continue to uh, be thankful for the goodwill we have with her and, and that you know she's willing to contribute in the way she's willing to contribute. And are there any other um, like the, Esri, the license for the ArcGIS or Tableau or any other accounting software or any of the other softwares, um, is there a need to put them in here? Well, we got the Esri license in there. So. Yeah, so, so, so these were, like Ray was saying right at the beginning, these are things that we've essentially already approved. And so the, the, next, the next step after we approve this budget is essentially to allow the executive committee to take responsibility for these things that the board has generally already approved in this budget. If we come back with, and we decide that we need another software package later, we will bring it back to the entire board, perhaps put it in this administrative budget for the executive committee to manage. But otherwise, unless it's in here, it's gonna come back to the whole board. Very good. And Ken. So in terms of legal, what then, um, because I, I, I guess, I, I think we may agree that, that it is gonna be more than that, but what do, what do the next few months represent in terms of that declining amount? Is that a specific set of tasks? Uh, there are a specific set of tasks. Let me just call up my last, uh, email with our attorney, <laughs> uh, which were those tasks were outlined. Here we go. Uh, so um, we're working, we're working on an easement issue having to do with full data collection, for example. Um, we have, and that's broken down into several different parts. <laughs> we have a Velcro, Velcro agreement that we're, we're working with and analyzing to see how our CUB group and our individual groups inter interact with this Velco agreement with WEF. Hey, we can't see anything. Yeah. Well, well, ho hopefully we shouldn't be seeing communications with yeah. the lawyer. I'd, I'd rather have, oh, I'd right. rather have okay. Ray describing it. Yeah, yep. we're, we're also working on a dark fiber agreement with um, uh, amongst the CUBs and we're doing cost sharing on that by the way, but we're working on a dark fiber agreement that we're going to execute, wind up executing with REC after we execute all the MOUs. And uh, there's some other work that we're doing with the three CUBs and, and uh, with REC. So this is, this is what's coming up. 
but then then it gets to my point i i can't imagine how that number ramps down uh, it, <laughs> it, it, it ramps it ramps down because we're expecting uh, may and june to be high months and then and then things to slow down a little bit and and i sure hope they do but if they don't um and, and the other thing i'd point out here is that when you saw the treasurer's report I would point out the bottom right hand corner here, we're looking at $50,000, less than $50,000. And if you recall the treasurer's report, which uh, I think that I uh, abandoned here. Let's see here. Uh, here's the treasurer's report. Uh, if you recall the treasurer's report, we actually have a balance of about $73,000. So there is some there is some money here. Uh, beyond what we had projected for the budget. So if we need more money, then uh, then we can uh, we can go to this. And plus, of course, you just heard David describe um, our our um, grant applications that we're going to be putting in. So so if so if the actual legal ends up being more, Ken, we will come back to the overall board and we'll adjust this uh, this figure up. I. I but I mean, my, my understanding is that the most of the agreements and most of the contract reviews um, will be able to get through this summer. And then hopefully, you know, in the fall, it will be, you know, some actual construction. So whether we need a, a, attorneys in all is not, was not completely clear. Any other questions or comments on this, this budget? I would assume that uh, attorney costs related to construction, et cetera, would be part of those grants and um, therefore sort of outside of what we're looking at here. That's that's what I'm expecting, Ray, if you have any. Yeah, at, at this point in time, I, I do as well. Okay. Anything else? All right, any objections to adopting this administrative budget? Okay, hearing none, I will assume that we have unanimous approval. Thank you for that. And Ray, want to go into part two? Yeah, so um, the, the motion here is that the, the move that the board authorize the executive committee to approve invoices and authorize payments from the just adopted administrative budget and that the treasurer report monthly to the board on the status of the administrative budget its ability to meet future obligation and bills paid for the previous month. And that's the motion. Second. Okay. okay, moved by Ray, seconded by Jeremy. The idea here is to streamline, because we're gonna have a lot of bills to pay coming up quickly, the idea is that rather than waiting and waiting for perhaps a month or you know, bringing the governing board back twice a month or three times a month to approve some of these these payments, that with this sort of carefully constrained list of things, that we would put that to the executive committee to pay, and then we can bring back at a at a regular meeting what what actually happened, what was paid. We can do that as part of the the treasurer's report. Any uh, thoughts or questions about this? This is this is a, a reasonably large delegation of authority to the executive committee. I should just make sure that everybody's clear what what's going on here. I know that a number of the other oops, another a number of the other CUDs have the same executive committee function. A rule, you know, just to to simplify and auto, you know get things moving in a timely fashion. Yeah, e EC Fiber actually suggested that we do this probably about two years ago. And I'm not. I'm not sure. Mainly because we haven't had that many bills, and it really hasn't been too onerous. But it's it, it's about to get onerous. I think it's a natural evolution as we go uh, become more real, and there's more activity. It's uh, it's a more of a staff structure as well. All right. Sounds good. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. I'm not seeing any, so I will take, there's no objections, I will take this as unanimous approval. Thanks again, everybody. 
All right, this was uh, this is good stuff. And if Ray, you could, if you could minimize your screen again, that would be swell. Or st stop sharing, I should say. Yeah, well, we don't want to go there, do we? <laughs> There's all right. Business. There we go. There we go. Good. I gotcha. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, PM search update. Uh, you want to report back also on the how the project manager search is going? Sure. Um, first, I'd like to thank the finance committee for all the work and, and uh, Jerry, uh, the treasurer, for all the work in putting the process and the administrative budget together. Uh, uh, with regard to the pro uh, the uh, PM search, what I can tell you is that on the subcommittee uh, is David, uh, Tom, Tim Sullivan, and myself. Uh, we received over 30 applications for the position. We've gone through four rounds of um, review and discussion and Zoom meetings. And uh, we've now narrowed it down to uh, less than a handful of folks. Um, next week, we'll be doing uh, Zoom interviews and following up on references. So I think sometime over the next couple of three weeks, um, we'll be getting something um, uh, to the executive committee and then to the board. Sounds great. Any, any questions for Ray or thoughts about the PM, PM search? Okay. And just, just one. Add, add one thing, and that um, yeah, Jerry made aware of for, uh, for the earlier board meeting. But Jerry is, was one of the people submitting an application for the position. So that's a exciting opportunity, I think. There, especially no, knowing his background. Okay. Uh, anything else on a project manager stuff, folks? All right. We are. Basically, well, we're, we're, we're a little late, but that's all right. We had a pretty cramped agenda. Um, state and federal funding, legislative action, affordability, et cetera. So uh, H 360 passed its second reading today, this morning. Uh, House Gov, I'm sorry, Senate Government Operations um, made one small recommendation for a change, and that was to uh, strike a sentence from the language about um, the trade secrets uh, statute clarification um, that they made so that um, the language that they struck was, uh, I'm trying to remember what it said, but it's essentially um, at the end of a project, the language would have required CUDs to release all, um, all project materials and they would no longer be exempt as trade secrets. But as it stands right now, this essentially just clarifies current law and those, if they are, if they remain sensitive, those parts that remain sensitive would still be um, subject to the trade secrets exemption of the public records law. Public records law. Um, I think David did a pretty good job of showing you where some of the, the various funding, the ARPA funds um, are coming from for the municipalities. That was a line item in there. Line items from the, the pre-construction grants and we will see um, construction grants probably coming out. Um, we will see the, how they allocate those buckets before long. Uh, next, uh, more like next year, probably later, or maybe later this year. Um, any other legislative action that I'm, um, I, I should be mentioning? David? No, Ray, I mean, the, the, the conference committee has got to decide whether there's a, a board or an authority. <laughs> That'll be the big right. thing. And right. So there'll That's, be a board or an authority that oversees the giving out of the construction money. Right. So that will presumably pass the Senate without much uh, to do. Um, and then it'll go to the yeah the committee of conference. We, we're we'll take a handful of House members from Energy and Tech, probably a handful of senators from Senate Finance, probably, and they'll essentially choose the pieces of the House and the Senate versions that they like the best that they can agree on, and then it will get to the governor's desk and um, probably get signed there. Um, if uh, and then should that all go through, then yeah, then magic starts to happen, I expect. But yeah, there's a discussion, you know, how many how many people should be on this board? Where should it live? Uh, there was uh, 
very long discussion in a lot of different contexts about how that should go. Um, if you're really interested in sort of the kind of the permutations of that, feel free to, I'll set up a time and we can chat about it. I can tell you later in the week. I'm not gonna give other people insomnia cures. <laughs> um, affordability. So um, th there was a, a proposal that was uh, rejected by Senate Finance to put money into um, an effort from that Tom Evslin and uh, and company that they were proposing. Um, EC Fiber, I, I think I mentioned this in the past, EC Fiber allocated $100,000 to a, a 501c3 that they spun up and that's being run by Holly Groschner, the former CEO of um, Vermont Public Television, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so she's spearheading that. And the idea there is that that entity will be looking at ways that it can subsidize low-income Vermonters so that they have access to fiber when we get there. Um, so that's through that um, through that nonprofit. Um, I don't really have anything else on this. Any anybody have any questions or any other thoughts on this sort of broad topic, Henry? I, you had mentioned the H three fifteen, I believe, earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the status on on that one? It's passed. It was signed by the governor. It's it's out. It's ready to go. Okay. We'll be seeing the the funding from that rather soon. What's the yeah? What's the actual timing on that, David? Do you remember? Uh, he says in the next two weeks. Okay. So I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, two more weeks. Two more weeks. Yeah, Alan. Jeremy, during the Senate uh, committee hearings, there was some testimony from Matt Dunn and a couple other people about the 10-year telecommunications plan that's supposed to be wrapping up this summer. Mm -hmm. Do you is that does that have any effect on us? Is it are we going to be expected to respond to this? Or I I don't quite understand how this is going to fit into anything that's happening, or isn't um, it expected to fit into anything? So it's it's kind of, it's kind of running in, in parallel. I mean, presumably it's going to say things about CUDs and the eventual build out, but um, I, I can't imagine us waiting for that to be finished. Uh, I'm going to put a um, there's a link that it just came out. <clears throat> it's just released today from um, Clay Purvis at uh, DPS. Um, there's a public comments draft of the 10-year telecommunications plan. So if you, this is like literally four hours ago. So if you want to go check that out, there is a draft. There's an opportunity for written comments and such. So um, you can see what that looks like at the moment. Um, and if you don't, if you can't see the chat for whatever reason, uh, if you're, w you're watching this later or whatnot, if you go to publicservice.vermont.gov, if you just go into their news, their most recent like uh, news items, whatever, you should see it there. It shouldn't be... Uh, Shouldn't be too terribly hard to find. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else on uh, state and federal funding, legislative action, affordability? Okay, moving right along, uh, insurance update. So um, our insurance, the moment that we start actually building things, um, our insurance obviously has to change. I, I think we have probably several months before that's any sort of concern. Um, our current insurance should cover us for the sort of stuff that we're doing um, up until we start actually, you know, buying stuff. Uh, so I'm working with our current insurer, um, trying to figure out what's necessary and what's not. And it, <laughs> in working with him, I, I'm going to have a meeting with him tomorrow or Thursday. There's all sorts of weird, like, contractor, like, as if we were engin an engineering firm. So that we, the insurance that we have to have to do any of this other stuff. So like errors and omissions at like, as if we were doing engineering and we are, it, we are not doing that. We're contracting that out. And he said, nope, doesn't matter. You're, you're involved. Therefore you have to, you have to take out the E and O insurance as well. So I have to sit down with him and we're going to go through what it is that we actually need. And he's going to, these, uh, if you're not uh, Josh Jarvis or you know other folks who have dealt with insurance a lot, these 
insurance forms. I have a PhD and this is impenetrable. Um, so it's, so he, he's, uh, we'll hopefully have that wrapped up in the next, uh, next day or so. And also, um, I should also update, the, uh, in order to get a certificate of public good to be a, you know, essentially recognized as a telecommunications carrier, which is going to be one of the things that's required for us to work with um, Green Mountain Power with their, uh, it's, it's for their, their pull make ready subsidies. We have to go through this process. And uh, the last thing I have to do is I have to put together a um, disaster recovery plan. And I finally got a something that I can work from today. So um, having done disaster recovery plans in a information security field, this looks a little bit different, but it's not, it, it doesn't really seem to be that, that heavy of a lift. So I will put that together and that will be out by the end of the week, hopefully too. Great. Okay. Yeah, Henry? I can help you or review that if you want. Yes, I will. I will reach out to you, Henry. Wonderful. Thanks for that. So unless any folks have questions about insurance, let's start wrapping this up. Let's go to round table one minute late. Um, I will, oops. Let's see, we'll start from Alan Gilbert. Boy, things felt like the clutch was being released and we're getting into gear. Great meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. It does feel good. Uh, Chuck? Just want to echo that. Thank you all for the, the great hard work. What what progress. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, David Healy? I'm good. All right. Thanks, David. David Went. Anything you'd like to add? or? Sorry. Just... Trying to get my mute button. Nothing to add. Thanks. All right. Thanks, David. Henry? I'm good. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Henry. Jeremy? I just want to say it's kind of exciting to be here as the uh, actual delegate rather than the alternate for the first time. But anyway, thanks a lot for all the work that everyone's doing. Uh, it's, it's exciting. All right. Uh, John Morris? Uh, thanks, everybody, for all your work. All right. Thanks, John. Josh? Uh, yeah, just again, want to say thank you to everyone for all the work that that's being done. And uh, Jeremy, again, thank you so much for taking the heavy lift on that insurance. Um, and when you come up with a, a time frame uh, for that phone call, would you mind shooting me that time? If I'm not currently already in, um, meetings I would love to at least attend the, the uh, call with you sure I will I will see what his schedule looks like I haven't I haven't nailed it down yet I got another email from him today but I will I will certainly do that okay Ken yeah a couple meetings ago we talked a little bit about the fact that Montpelier is getting its fiber connections and they're actually now happening the front porch forum is starting to fill with people saying that they're getting their fiber connections from consolidated and I had posed the question to the communications group as to whether we can de develop some material to help people understand what fiber connection is. Um, because I'm starting to get people calling me um, to, to ask about should they hook up to fiber. And I know it's, it's not a simple request, but I, I, I would ask now that the communications committee consider it again, whether we can just for our own, as we begin to have people up, have some material that describes what it means to be hooked up to fiber. And we'll take and, that under advisement. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chuck. And if, if, if you guys end up taking that up, I would like to have a, uh, if I could have to have a quick chat with you, uh, I have some other information that might be useful there. All right. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Lucy. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm very honored to be in this group of such incredible expertise. So thank you everyone for bringing your A game to the table. I wish I had more to contribute. Um, I'm here mostly because I really believe in access. Um, it's and this year has really proven that more than anything. Um, hopefully, as we get into a, a public outreach phase of things, I'll be 
of more use to this group. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Michael? Um, I'll pass, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Phil? Then I'll pass, thank you. Okay, Ray? Uh, yeah, so um, we got a lot done tonight. Some of it had to do with process. Some of it had to do with actually moving the chains on um, getting some work done. Some of it has to do with getting, uh, getting acquiring money. Um, the work is only going to become more and the speed is going to pick up significantly. And so, you know, buckle up and uh, be prepared to work in your committees. And you might be meeting more than once a month. And I think the executive committee is going to meet at least twice a month in order to keep up with everything. Sounds okay. good. Thanks, Ray. Siobhan? Adding my thanks to everybody else. Thanks so much for all the work y'all are doing. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, Tim? Uh, I'm good. Everything sounds like it's going well. And, uh, Chuck, I'll be making sure I attend more of those uh, other meetings there. All right. Thanks, Tim. Tom? Glad to start off the new year uh, and uh, looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody. The uh, you know, many hands make light work and such. This is, you know, it, it, it felt like we were you know like we had the light at the end of the tunnel and i think we're starting to you know we're starting to enter the tunnel or maybe you know finish <laughs> not enter the tunnel get get towards the exit we're we're almost there almost there so thanks everybody um have a good rest of your week hope the weather stays warmer and uh we'll talk to you all soon